Good morning. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. Asian stocks struggling for traction after Wall Street's tech rally with Nvidia rebounding. Fed officials call for further evidence of cooling inflation before cutting rates. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin warns that an all-out war between Israel and Hezbollah would have terrible consequences. That is at the U.S. that struggles to avert a wider conflict. Plus, Nigeria's central bank governor tells us exclusively that the bank is relatively pleased with the progress it has made in stabilizing the Naira. We have more or less seen the worst in terms of volatility. Uh -huh. I believe we've seen the worst in volatility. Well, it's just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Joanna Versace in Dubai. We are going to be speaking a lot more about uh, some of those comments from the Central Bank of Nigeria governor, an interview that uh, our colleague uh, Jennifer had overnight. But before we do that, let's get straight into these markets, a reassessment of what happened yesterday, because what goes down evidently does come back up again. We saw a huge rally once again in NVIDIA, up 7 percent, erasing some of the losses of the prior, game, uh, prior days, uh, which meant that the Nasdaq ended up in the green up more than 1.1%. As you can see, S&P futures also getting a bit of a boost from some of the performance. Also, one stock in focus there was FedEx. That stock, which tends to be a, quite a good barometer for how the broader economy was doing, ended the session up 15%. So again, a lot of green on the board. You can see futures, though, trading sideways as we head into the European Open. Also keeping a close eye on what's been happening in currency space. Uh, dollar yen sitting very close to 160. Again, this as traders start to think about the possibility of another rate hike out of the Bank of Japan in July and uh, at some form of intervention given the levels of where the yen is right now. And then Aussie also in focus today up more than 0.4 percent this after CPI surprise to the upside again allowing investors to bet on a higher probability of a rate hike at the next meeting. So something to think about there. But in terms of Nvidia this was a really interesting chart that we've been watching this morning and that just tells you uh, the difference between what's been going on with equal weight Nasdaq versus uh, the actual um, uh, normal Nasdaq index that we look at. And what you can see here is that on the equal weight index, uh, you are seeing a massive outperformance, uh, underperformance versus the Nasdaq index, which is obviously geared towards NVIDIA because of its heavy weighting and tells you that even within the Nasdaq, it is one stock only, and that is NVIDIA that continues to drive those gains. So very interesting chart there. All right, for more on what is happening in Asia, Eva, we touched on the moves in dollar-yen, but perhaps you can give us a little bit more commentary around what is happening with these Aussie markets today. Absolutely. We're seeing the Australian dollar climbing. It is the outperformer among the G10s on the upside surprise for a third straight month. And this is raising those concerns. Are the rates down under restrictive enough? Certainly, we heard from the RBA governor just last week saying that those rate hikes are not off the table. So we're seeing selling also on stocks and bonds. They're really getting hammered. This is on a day where we're seeing a bit of an uptick thanks to that rebound in NVIDIA, so tech share real estate ones not doing that badly. Chinese equities are the laggard despite the continuing bond rally. These Chinese yields continue dropping on the 10-year today hitting the lowest in more than two decades. Let's flip the board because as we see this climb in the Aussie dollar, the buying is underway there but the selling I think is being exacerbated on the yen. So this is actually interesting to see how dollar yen after the Aussie print dropped actually popped even even closer towards the 160 level, raising those risks of intervention, Jumana. Avril, thank you so much. That was Avril Hong in Singapore. Well, one of our top stories uh, overnight, at least five people have been killed after anti-government protests in Nairobi turned violent. Kenyan police fired on demonstrators on Tuesday as they stormed the National Assembly building. Lawmakers have passed controversial new tax measures being pushed by the president, William Ruto, in a bid to improve government finances, address Kenya's high debt ratio and access more IMF funding. Now, protesters want the entire tax plan scrapped and instead want the administration to focus on rooting out corruption and ending non-priority spending. We will be talking more about that on the show. And elsewhere, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has warned that an all-out war between Israel and Hezbollah would be a catastrophe for Lebanon and the region. Another war between Israel and Hezbollah could easily become a regional war with terrible consequences for the Middle East. 
And so diplomacy is by far the best way to prevent more escalation. So we we're urgently seeking a diplomatic agreement that restores lasting calm to Israel's northern border and enables civilians to return safely to their homes on both sides of the Israel-Lebanon border. Austin met with Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, who is in Washington this week for talks with U.S. officials. Now, for more on this, Bloomberg's managing editor for the Middle East and North Africa, Owner Ant, joins me now from Istanbul. Uh, we've been monitoring the conversations that Gallant has been having in the U.S. the last couple of days, but how likely is it really that the U.S. are going to be able to prevent a war between Israel and Hezbollah? Uh, thank you, Jemana. In fact, um, Austin's uh, remarks on the uh, necessity of diplomacy between Israel uh, and Hezbollah to avoid a war uh, and his warnings against such an eventuality isn't really inconsistent with the long-standing American position on this. But what is important, I think, in today's, well, yesterday's meetings between Israel Defense Minister Galat and his American counterpart is the fact that in many weeks uh, and months, this was the first time a top American official so openly and publicly pushed back against the notion. Uh, and not only did he do that, but he also pointed out the fact that should there be a war, an open war, all-out war between Israel and Hezbollah, uh, it would be the civilians on both sides, including in Israel, that would bear the brunt uh, of, uh, of such a war. There would be civilian casualties. And why is this exactly important? Because it was Golan's uh, top priority to secure American backing for such an eventuality. And that would obviously include an expedited delivery of American arms and munitions into Israel in preparation of such a war with Hezbollah. And that's something that Israeli Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has expressed delays uh, and other problems over the last few months, therefore making Austin's comments yesterday alongside Gallant extremely important. Mm. Well, we're also keeping a close eye on the domestic situation in Israel. Uh, very notable yesterday that the uh, Israel Supreme Court has now ordered the government to start conscripting uh, ultra-Orthodox men into military service. How do you think this is going to impact the government there and Netanyahu's coalition? Uh, as you said, this has been largely a domestic issue in Israel for decades now. Uh, Ultra-Orthodox men have been exempt from military service, mandatory military service, since pretty much the uh, founding of the state of Israel seven, more than seven decades ago. Uh, but now, with the eruption of the war against Hamas and Gaza since October last year, this has become more emotive, more urgent, and the Israeli top court uh, said its final word on this just yesterday. But what happens next is going to make this more of a possibly event uh, with international and political repercussions rather than just a domestic Israeli issue because uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's two key partners in the coalition, in the government coalition, are two religious parties to join this coalition under the understanding that ultra-Orthodox men, or uh, Haradim, as you said, uh, will be continue to enjoy those exemptions. Now, it's clear that Benjamin Netanyahu has been unable to deliver that by putting that into law. And now, after the top court has openly ordered the government to enlist those ultra-Orthodox men into conscription, into army service, clearly uh, he's been unable to deliver the promise to key uh, coalition partners. Now, it's clear that Benjamin Netanyahu's liquid party is still the best alternative to stick with for those religious parties uh, compared to others to the further left of the political spectrum in Israel. But still, as we go forward, as we see the execution and implementation of this order, however late that may be, we are going to see that this issue will put a strain on uh, the relationship between those two key partners of the coalition uh, and, against, um, uh, and against Netanyahu. So that's going to be uh, something to watch to, in terms of the survival of the coalition that Netanyahu is leading in Israel. Yeah, yeah, which already is, uh, is, is, is on thin ice, uh, given some of the fractures we've seen within that government. Uh, thank you so much for that overview. That was Bloomberg's managing editor for the Middle East and North Africa, Honor Ant. Well, still ahead, uh, will the state of the U.S. economy, uh, we are going to discuss the state of the U.S. economy with Morgan Stanley's Rajiv Sibal as bond traders make bold bets on Fed cuts. This is Bloomberg.
with significant progress on inflation and the labor market cooling gradually, at some point it will be appropriate to reduce the level of policy restriction to maintain a healthy balance in the economy. The timing of any such adjustment will depend on how economic data evolve and what they imply for the economic outlook and balance of risks. That was Federal Reserve Governor Lisa Cook on the U.S. inflation and rates outlook. Now, while the Fed is pricing 40 basis set point cuts by the end of the year, bond traders in the U.S. are boldly betting on 300 basis points of Fed cuts by March. That's just what uh, traders are betting on. Let's bring in Rajiv Sibal, senior global economist at Morgan Stanley. Good to have you with us, Rajiv. Good morning. Uh, let me just start off with uh, what your view is on, on what the Fed are going to do. When do they start cutting? Yeah, we have a call that the Fed is going to start cutting in September. Uh, our Fed call is basically our inflation call, and we think that inflation okay. will be there in September and enable them to start their cutting path. Why is the inflation, why is it your inflation call and not your labor market call? Right now we think that the labor market is tight, it's resilient, and the focus is on figuring out if inflation can come down even though the labor market is tight. Mm. We have a forecast that the labor market will start to see kind of a softness and the unemployment rate will rise. But the, the primary focus for us right now is inflation. Yeah. And what do you think when you see... Uh, the pricing of the markets and the fact that a, a big substantial portion of bond traders are out there betting on a very swift cutting cycle once the Fed actually starts. Are you of the view that we're going to end up in a table mountain or a Matterhorn situation no, where I it's, think, quite, it's quite steeply down? Yeah, no, this is a big challenge. I mean, the markets have been changing their view on, on Fed pace for quite some time. If you go back to the beginning of the year versus today, we've seen a lot of volatility there. We have a pretty steady path on our, our forecast. We think that the Fed will do 25 basis point cuts in consecutive meetings uh, through to the middle of next year. But uh, the, the markets have this tendency to, once they start cutting, expect kind of a consistent path. Um, and I think that will continue to move around as data moves around. What about the global inflation cycle? You say that by September, inflation will be uh, the justification for the Fed to start the cutting cycle, how does it sit with other central banks around the world? We see actually a pretty similar path between the ECB, the Bank of England, and, and the Federal Reserve. We have them all starting their cuts and the timing of the cuts at very slightly different intervals. But overall, what we see is that inflation in the most developed economies should be around 25 to 3% by the end of this year, and then easing down into target by the middle of next year. So that's pretty consistent across the major developed economies. Yeah, so we had some commentary from ECB's Ali Ren overnight. Uh, and he was saying, obviously, he is one of the more dovish members of the ECB, but he's saying seize bets for two more cuts in 2024 as reasonable, uh, policy shouldn't overburden the economy, etc. Do you see another two more cuts then out of the so ECB? So that is actually it's... our call. Uh, we have two more cuts coming out of the ECB this year mm. and then four more next year. So for us, uh, that's a reaffirmation of our view on inflation and the ECB. So just to pick up on these comments, he's saying he does not see disorderly market moves in France. Let me just ask you how you're viewing the recent volatility in French bond markets as we head into the first round of these elections. Yeah, look, Morgan Stanley has done a lot of work on and analyzing the French election, but I think it caught many people by surprise. For us, what I'm focused on is some work that we've done on debt markets and looking at the path of sovereign debt for the French economy. The next budget cycle will be very important for that, and so seeing what the new government puts together in terms of the budget will be critical for that, but it's really hard to predict that right now. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, we are in an environment now where I think the focus has actually started to shift towards how much debt many sovereign countries are sitting on, be it distressed uh, African nations, uh, a lot of stories coming out of the region there, debt restructuring, but then also you hear the likes of France being downgraded by S&P. You hear a lot of scrutiny of U.S. public finances. Obviously, U.S. is the world reserves currency, so it's a bit of a different situation, but when you look at the state of countries' public finances, how worried are you about the trajectory in this higher interest rate environment? We, we, we're concerned, uh, but we're not quite at the threshold where we're panicking yet, so to speak. What is that um, threshold? So mathematically, if you look at the sovereign debt across most developed economies, what you see is that the cost of the debt starts to approach market rate, rates in about 2029, 2030. And so when you get towards the end of the decade, you'll start to have an increased burden of interest costs. And yeah. so mathematically, if fiscal burdens start to consolidate going into that, then you're in a little bit more of a stable environment. But if the fiscal deficit starts to widen going into the rising debt costs, then you have a problem. And so that's why I say the next budget cycle is critically important because that will determine 
kind of the path of the fiscal outlook over the next three years. Yeah, and I'm just going to simplify that to some of the viewers. Essentially, what you're saying is uh, the outstanding stock of debt is very high, but it's being serviced right now at low interest rates historically. But Absolutely. as they continue, as if rates continue to stay where they are and they refinance, they're going to end up with much higher yeah, servicing absolutely. costs. So that ben becomes a problem in 2029. We're benefiting yeah. from the legacy of lower rates still. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Rajiv, well, thank you so much for coming on the show and your around-the-world view of, of uh, how Morgan Stanley sees economics right now. Rajiv Sebal, Senior Global Economist at Morgan Stanley. Now for a look at some of the other stories we're following. Uh, we're speaking of France. Leaders of France's three biggest political groups have clashed in their first televised debate ahead of Sunday's first round poll. Centrist Prime Minister Gabriel Attal sought to defend his government's record, while far-right national rally leader Jordan Bardella focused on his tough stance on immigration and crime. And representative of the new popular front leftist alliance, Manuel Bompard, Bushed, pushed plans to lower their retirement age and tax the rich. Most surveys show the national rally leading with the alliance in second place and Macron's group trailing in third. And a gag order against Donald Trump in his New York hush money case has been largely lifted. A judge ruled that Trump could now talk about witnesses and jurors, though he's barred from revealing jurors' identities. That gives him more leeway to criticize the proceedings as he campaigns for the White House. Trump and President Biden are due to debate each other tomorrow. Oh, coming up, uh, KOTU management founder Philippe Lafont shares what he thinks is the next big thing after AI and why he remains bullish on tech. This is Bloomberg. Short run, it's true that the mentions of AI in every TV and, uh, and written form is very high. And so one could say, wow, if everybody talks about it, it must be priced in. And the only reason why I'm more positive is I remember when I invested in Apple in 2009, when the iPhone first came out. And for years, people told me, why are you invested in Apple? Everybody talks about Apple. And obviously, it had an incredible run. So I actually think that sometimes because someone speaks a lot about something, it might be actually a good sign versus an overhyped sign. Now, some people on Wall Street say the best way to invest in AI is go invest in the big companies that are already doing AI, uh, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, and so forth. Others say go find the smaller companies that might grow into the next NVIDIA. So what is your own view? I'm conflicted. On one hand, the history of technology seems to be that the big, the big get bigger. But also, sometimes out of nowhere, a new company gets created, like uh, Facebook or TikTok. And at the beginning of these new waves, the new winners 10 or 20 years out, some of them are existing companies and some of them are new. But the new ones that get big, there's maybe one a year, no more. All right, let's suppose I say I missed the AI wave. I wasn't smart enough to get there. But there's another technology wave always coming along. So what's the next technology thing I should invest in if it's not AI? What's, what's coming behind AI that is going to excite tech investors? Um, two things. One is if you peel the onion of AI and you think about all the building blocks necessary for AI, you might stumble on uh, real estate with data centers or utilities with power. I find the power is really interesting. So it shows that before I answer the new new, there is a sort of an onion effect and you can peel it. There's a lot going on with AI. On the new new thing, um, AI is sort of gonna be this amazing sort of artificial brain. What I wonder is what happens when you put that brain inside of a robot and we humans need to then live side by side with humanoids. I'm like, wow, I don't know exactly when it happens. Maybe it's 10, 15 years. Musk says it's five, other people say it's 25. Take the average, 15 years. That's gonna be pretty exciting. Oh, fascinating insights there from KOTU management founder and portfolio manager, Philippe Lafont at the Bloomberg Invest event in New York. 
Now for a look at some of the other stories we're following today. The Barclays CEO says it is unrealistic to abandon fossil fuel clients, saying banks can't go cold turkey as the transition to cleaner energy will take time. Speaking to Bloomberg, CS Venkatar Krishnan joined a chorus of bank CEOs pushing back on climate activists. The bankers have cautioned that a complete withdrawal from fossil fuels comes with unacceptable energy security risks. We are very much moving from away from coal to oil, oil to gas, gas to clean energy. Okay. And the reality is that for quite some time, fossil fuels will be with us, right? Especially natural gas. So that glide path is long. Um, and, the, and the world and the world economy cannot go cold turkey on this tomorrow. And shares in FedEx soared by more than 15% in the aftermarket after the shipper forecast profit above Wall Street's expectations and announced a $2.5 billion share buyback. The company is predicting adjusted earnings in the 2025 fiscal year will be between $20 and $22 a share, with revenue expected to grow in the mid to low single digits. FedEx says it expects $2.2 billion in permanent cost reductions in this fiscal year. And Rivian's shares jumped after the bell in New York as Volkswagen announced plans to invest $5 billion in a joint venture with the EV maker. The tie-up will give VW access to Rivian's technology for its cars. It's also a much-needed source of fresh capital for Rivian, which has struggled to ramp up production and deliveries. And a quick look at equities before we head out to the break. Uh, we saw a, quite a strong session yesterday, a rebound in NVIDIA. The stock was up more than 7%. Uh, today, you can see that both the S&P and NASDAQ are leaning towards the green, but moderately so, basically trading sideways. The Dow inching towards the red. And then your stocks futures uh, in Europe, uh, just shy of 5,000, but also looking to open up in the green. A quick look at U.S. Treasuries as well. And um, yesterday, we had a two-year auction in the U.S. It went uh, uneventful. So uh, not, not a lot to speak about there, but the bigger uh, market moving event could be with that five year auction that's happening later today. Here you can see in front of us it's sitting below 4.3 percent. The 10 year yield sitting at 4.26 percent. This as traders price in around uh, just shy of 45 basis points of rate cuts by the end of the year. Also coming up on our show, Radio Free Mobile's uh, Richard Windsor is going to be on to talk all things AI and uh, in video. We'll be right back. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. Asian stocks struggling for traction after Wall Street's tech rally, with NVIDIA rebounding. Fed officials call for further evidence of cooling inflation before cutting rates. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin warns an all-out war between Israel and Hezbollah would have, been, would have terrible consequences. The, this is that the U.S. struggles to avert a wider conflict. Plus, Nigeria's central bank governor tells us exclusively that the worst of the volatility in the currency, the Naira, is over. More from that interview in about 10 minutes' time. And it's just gone 8.30 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jamana Brissacci in Dubai. Quick check on markets. Uh, we are leaning into the green at uh, this after a positive session yesterday. NVIDIA climbing once again up more than 7%. Also FedEx, another stock that we're keeping a close eye on, 15% higher in after hours. So that meant that the Nasdaq ended the session in the green up more than 1.1%. Today, S&P futures are trading sideways. Uh, dollar yen also in focus, sitting just shy of 160. And then Aussie also seeing a, a bit of a bid come through after the surprisingly hot CPI print that is led investors to believe that there could be a possibility of perhaps another hike coming out of the RBA at the next meeting. So something to keep an eye out for there. The red hot CPI number out of Australia is driving some of the performance. In terms of our terminal chart, uh, this one I wanted to flag because I thought it was interesting just to show that even within the Nasdaq, it is, of course, NVIDIA that is driving the gain. So if you compare the equal weighted Nasdaq, that is the uh, well, this is just a ratio between the two of them. You can see that the uh, market cap weighted Nasdaq has massively outperformed the equal weight Nasdaq, telling you that, of course, because NVIDIA has such a huge market cap, takes up such a huge uh, chunk of the Nasdaq index, that is the reason that that index is outperforming versus the equal weight due to NVIDIA. 
Now, Newberger Berman's Steve Eisman says he considers NVIDIA a long-term play. Eisman, best known for his big short bet against subprime mortgages ahead of the global financial crisis, says he owns a lot of shares of the company at the heart of the AI boom. I mean, if you look at the chart on NVIDIA, you can barely see the correction. So, I mean, you know, on a percentage basis, it's down something like 10 percent. But you have to, like, peer really, really carefully at the chart to see that move. So I don't think it means anything. The people who own that stock know it's expensive, but they're buying into a story. And as long as the story is intact, like NVIDIA is obviously intact, the story is going to continue. The story is going to continue. Joining us now is Richard Windsor, founder of Radio Free Mobile. Good morning to you, Richard. Are you of the view that the NVIDIA story is just the story that's going to keep on giving? Um, this, this is such a great question. So uh, I think while the current <laughs> AI bubble remains inflated, um, which it is, uh, NVIDIA will continue to do well, and I suspect that the stock will continue to rise. Now, the, the reason for that is... If you look at NVIDIA relative to other AI companies, particularly in the unlisted sector, its valuation is not that expensive. But particularly if you look at it on a profit basis, don't forget this company has a $100 billion business that it makes 80% gross margins on. So it pumps out profit like there's no tomorrow. And that puts it on a P multiple somewhere in forward looking, somewhere in the mid 30s, which is not that bad when you consider Microsoft and Apple mm. and where its peers are. But NVIDIA is on the AI roller coaster, and no matter what happens, it won't be able to get off. So when the correction comes, and there will be a correction, NVIDIA will go down with the rest, although because it has such strong fundamentals, I suspect it will go down less. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you say that because, um, you know, once eventually that there, there will be a correction, we thought that that was yesterday, but it turns out yesterday was just a bit of a blip because we fully recovered the, the ground lost. Uh, I do wonder what that means for the broader tech sector, because NVIDIA really is responsible, even within the S&P, for something like 10 percent of the S&P's total gains since uh, 2023. So if NVIDIA starts coming under pressure, what does that do to the rest of the complex? Um, I think it's a specific case. If you look at NVIDIA's stock, if you look at the RSI indicator, it was clearly overbought. There was that story about Jensen selling $95 million worth of stock. And which, in my opinion, is a non-story. Anyone in NVIDIA right now, in their right mind, would be selling the stock, not because they think it's overvalued, but because it has become such a large proportion of their own net worth. For To be a reasonable and practical investor, you would be forced to diversify into other areas. So for me, that's a non-story. I think it was just a technical correction. A lot depends on what NVIDIA reports next quarter. Yeah. You, know, you hear of the large tech companies uh, investing hundreds of billions of dollars, and I think the total number is like trillions over the next couple of years in the AI space. How much of that actually is going to uh, produce a, a reasonable return on investment? I mean, investors seem to be cheered on by the fact that companies like Facebook, Meta are, are coming out with these big capex plans. But in reality, how lucrative are they going to be and how long is it going to take for these AI use cases to be profitable? Really excellent question. Um, <clears throat> and actually, that is where NVIDIA can make a case for itself because its advances in chips do make it cheaper. Uh, to answer your question directly, nobody knows. Um, the, one of the problems I have, and one thing that concerns me greatly, is when you look at what everyone is charging, $20 per user per month, $30 per user per month, in an environment where there are lots of new services popping up all the time, where there's plenty of pretty good services for free in the open source community, you would start to wonder whether or not you're going to start to see massive price erosion. And in fact, that is our scenario. We expect to see massive price erosion in generative AI services. And that is what we think will trigger the correction. Question is, when will it come? So long story short is what I would expect from the CapEx side is if pricing comes down a lot, the returns are going to drop massively and you'll see them cut back their CapEx. Yeah. Uh, and one of the interesting things about NVIDIA is obviously the fact that they can hold on to such a high margin way above uh, the rest of their peers. So it will be interesting to see whether that actually translates uh, later on to the use cases, one of them being generative AI. Another question that comes up a lot around the contours of this discussion is the power that these data centers are going to be consuming 
Uh, and there's a view out there that we are going to be running into some hurdles when it comes to the ability to generate enough power to actually allow these data centers to, to, to function. Uh, do you see that as a potential constraint or a headwind to come in the years to follow? Uh, yes, it is definitely it is definitely a problem. Um, if you look at some of the forecasts, you can see data centers in some countries going from like five percent of total power consumption to twenty percent of total power consumption. So it is definitely an issue. I would say two things. One, I suspect a correction may deal with some of that problem and a reset to reality in terms of what AI can really do compared to what it actually can't, which is what people are thinking about. You know, you hear things about super aware robots and super intelligence. In my opinion, that's not going to happen for a very, very long time. And so the real reality is probably somewhat lower in terms of what people are expecting. The second thing I think what the, you, that can deal with it is that there is a renaissance going on in nuclear power right now. Now, full disclosure, I'm an investor in this theme, have been for a very long time. But all the countries across the world, many are all rolling out new power, new nuclear power stations. You've even seen Amazon saying it will build a data center next to a nuclear power station. Um, and that is a very good option for steady base load and carbon free electricity for the, to power all of these data centers. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like that is going to be one of the big questions that people are asking the next couple of years. Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure as always. Richard thank Windsor, you. founder of Radio Free Mobile. OpenAI is taking additional steps to limit China's access to its AI tools. The Microsoft-backed startup plans to enforce its policy to block users in nations outside the territories it supports and has sent memos to Chinese developers telling them that they'll be cut off from July. China's local players, including Shipu AI, which is backed by Tencent and Alibaba, have announced incentives for switching to their own products. Now let's turn back to those protests in Nairobi uh, we told you about earlier in the program. At least five people were killed on Tuesday after Kenyan police fired on demonstrators as they stormed the National Assembly building. The crowd was protesting against controversial new tax measures being pushed by President William Ruto and with many already passed by lawmakers. So for more on this, Bloomberg's Ondiro Ganga joins me from Kigali. Ondiro, just walk us through the events that led to this moment. How did we get here? Jumana, this has been a long time coming. In 2023, 2024, the government passed the first finance bill that doubled VAT on fuel, introduced a controversial housing levy at 1.5, and increased income uh, tax. Kenyans protested this, but the government, because they had numbers in parliament, they were able to see this bill through. Come 2024, 2025, there's a new finance bill that proposes even more taxes, and some of the controversial clauses were taxes on bread, levies on fuel, import tax that was going to affect sanitary towels and diapers. And these rallied Kenyans amongst themselves. This got them really angry because they felt these taxes were going to mop up whatever little liquidity they had left. The government needs these taxes in order to raise revenue, balance their budget, and unlock funding from the IMF. But the people are not on the same page with the government this time around. They lobbied themselves on social media in numbers and hit the streets of Nairobi. Now, while they were out protesting, Parliament was taking a vote on this bill, and it easily sailed through the floor of parliament because the opposition party did not take a vote. Instead, they, they joined the protesters in calling for this bill to be dropped altogether. And while this was happening in parliament, some of these protesters in Nairobi, Kenya, were approaching parliament. They breached the gate and they gained grounds to the parliament grounds. And what happened next was the most tragic thing in the recent history of Kenya. We saw police shooting at these protesters using live rounds on live television. And international media was broadcasting showing two lifeless bodies lying outside of parliament. And the breach of parliament, according to analysts, yeah. just goes to show the magnitude of anger in Kenyans because this has never happened before, even in 2007 and 2008. Yeah. Yeah, pretty shocking images, and we've been showing them now on our screens. Uh, IMF, of course, warning uh, that Kenya's debt, 67% of debt GDP, is getting close to distress levels. And so uh, the government has to do something about the state of their deficits. Either they can uh, try to increase revenue, and in this case, uh, this, that's being met with a lot of protests, or cut spending. What are the government's options from here? 
Jumana, like you said, President William Ruto is caught between a rock and a hard place because if he sails through with this bill and signs it into law, he unlocks revenue from the IMF, but he's risking social political tension in the country. And so what is he to do? Is he to go back to the international market and borrow, but then yields are really expensive and investors are really, um, uh, they have some doubts about Kenya's fiscal stability. And we saw him come out yesterday. He was very bullish in his tone. He mentioned things like dangerous criminal and treason, saying, Saying that national security agencies have been deployed to thwart any threat to national security. On the other hand, President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, who was the fourth president of the Republic of Kenya, reminding President William Ruto that power was bestowed to him by the people and there's need for conversation. But these protesters are resolute in their determination to hit the streets over and over again until their grievances are addressed. Well. Well, we're going to keep an eye on the developments there. On zero, thank you for explaining to us uh, what is going on uh, in Kenya. On zero, Oganga in Kigali. Now, also coming up, we hear from Nigeria's central bank governor on why he's pleased with the progress that the Naira has made. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. Nigeria's central bank governor is confident that excessive Naira volatility may be a thing of the past. Oliemi Cardoso told us exclusively why stabilizing the currency is crucial for the West African nation to lure investors. We're relatively pleased with how far we've gotten up till now. In the past two, three weeks, after a period of volatility, we've seen a lot of stability within the market. Mm -hmm. There's hardly been any movement in the currency. Right. The rates have been merged in the past. You had two different rates. Right now, more or less have one rate. Mm -hmm. okay. And we believe that this is good. It allows um, companies to plan. Mm -hmm. And again, it gives an idea of where... Um, the potential um, road of travel is mm -hmm. for, for people who are investing in our economy. So I do, I'm relatively pleased with where we are. We don't believe that we've got into the you know, position we, we want to stay at. It's, mm. it's continuous work in progress. And we will do everything possible to ensure that we um, continue to manage um, the, the macroeconomic fundamentals that affect that, that, that um, market in such a way that it will continue to improve. Do you, do you anticipate more strength then for the Naira by the end of the year? Well, Or are we, are we stable where it's at right now? Well, that, that is a, a, a question which I would say would depend on a whole host of different issues. Mm -hmm. I do believe, I do believe that we have more or less seen the worst in terms of volatility. Uh -huh. I believe we've seen the worst in volatility. Um, we are happy that the market is now such that willing buyer and willing seller operate within the market. Um, we are also very alive to observing the way and manner in which that market operates mm -hmm. and ensuring that it gives um, the best value um, that, that can be accomplished using certain tools. It's also important to mention, though, that mm -hmm. the monetary and fiscal work closely together. Right. So I would only be giving you one picture if I said, you know, the, the, the monetary does that, or the monetary does something else, but they work very closely together. And I believe that that complementarity is what will give us the optimum rate for the Naira. Nigeria's central bank governor is speaking to Bloomberg's Africa correspondent, Jennifer Savazaja. And Jennifer joins us now from London, where she conducted the interview. Uh, Jen, good morning to you. Uh, you know, you look back at some of the central bank decisions that they've made over the last year. They've been very aggressive with the rate hikes, hiking more than 800 basis points over the course of the year. He seems to be pleased with the fruits of, of these efforts. Uh, does he think that we should see some stability in the currency going forwards? 
You know, uh, Jumana, that was uh, probably one of the most fascinating parts because we have seen Governor Cardoso uh, and uh, the central bank really be quite aggressive uh, to the pleasure uh, of a lot of analysts and investors that are paying close attention. Uh, and that is why he is uh, so bullish, really, on where the Naira is headed. Uh, now, if we think about just how much uh, that that's a great chart right there, just taking a look at really what we've seen with the Naira over the past year, especially uh, as President Tanubu has enacted a number of reforms. Uh, and the central bank has continued to hike rates. Uh, he does believe uh, that what we are seeing now, the relative stability that we've seen over the past few weeks, yes, uh, really are, in fact, uh, they, these reforms taking shape. And potentially then, uh, you know, we'll continue to see the Naira trading in this narrow range as we've seen over the past few weeks. Uh, and potentially then the confidence then will be uh, reinvigorated and we'll get uh, Nigeria will see more and more investors then uh, wanting to invest back into the economy. But uh, it, it is a hard pill to swallow because, you know, we talk about uh, inflation in Nigeria. It has been upwards of uh, 33 percent. Uh, we've seen month on month inflation decline uh, year on year, though. Uh, it's still quite high. And the central bank's target is closer uh, yeah. to six to nine percent this range. And so, uh, yes, it is positive news for the Naira, but still uh, not completely out of the woods for this economy. Yeah. Some ways to go then, uh, but it, it, yeah. you know we we have, we have to talk about what the government is doing too. It's not just the central bank. Uh, the government is embarking on some major economic reforms. What did the governor yeah. have to say about the reforms? Well, you know, we uh, we played uh, that clip right there where the governor was talking about how it is not just the monetary uh, that is responsible and aiding in the recovery of this economy. Of course, it is uh, the fiscal. And so we did ask him uh, whether or not he thinks some of these reforms that have been implemented or talked about uh, are working fast enough because it's key for these two to complement each other. Uh, and he did allude to the fact that he is hoping that uh, potentially there are more reforms put in place. Of course, we know about the fuel subsidies there. We're looking at pictures uh, of the fuel subsidies uh, that were removed and then partially uh, put back on. Uh, there's also some food import taxes uh, that have been re, uh, you know, renegotiated and thought about in the country. Uh, but still, he believes that their aggressive uh, hiking needs to be complemented with what the fiscal is doing. And the fiscus uh, is not yet uh, as, as aggressive as they need to be in order to get things revived. Mm, well, great interview, Jennifer. Uh, very good to get to, the chance to speak to the governor that was the Bloomberg's Africa correspondent, Jennifer Zabazaja, in London. Also coming up, Israel's top court rules ultra-Orthodox men must be drafted into the military. We discuss what this means for the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, coming up next. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. Israel's Supreme Court has ordered the government to start conscripting ultra-Orthodox men into military service. The landmark decision could test Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's ruling coalition, which depends on religious parties to function. So joining us now is Ethan Bronner, Bloomberg's senior editor in Tel Aviv. Uh, Ethan, just walk us through how significant this decision from Israel's Supreme Court actually is. Good morning, Jamana. Let me just uh, hold up the daily newspaper here of Yidio Dachernot, the main daily, uh, main selling paper, which says, historic day, one nation, one army, uh, give uh, the army the chance to win. So in terms of how the society views it, this is an extremely significant development because you have this portion of the society, the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, who have been separated from the central institution of this country uh, over these last 76 years. It didn't matter so much when there were such a small number in the beginning, but they have enormous families and they're now 13, 14 percent of the population. So in terms of a society, it's very important. It's also important uh, politically yes. because, as you said, the two uh. ultra-Orthodox parties are central to this government's coalition, uh, and uh, they are angry about the decision. So that leads me to my next question, Ethan, which is whether or not it's likely to endanger this coalition. Two of, of the parties of the coalition are from the ultra-Orthodox uh, side of things. Is there a risk that they leave or they pull out of the government? 
there is a small risk, but I think that um, ultimately they've been preparing for this. And they also, although ultra-Orthodox parties have joined governments of both left and right in Israel's history, they have essentially moved rightward in the last 20 years. And I think they have come to the conclusion that the, the best thing they can do is stay with this government and limit the so-called damage. And in other words, minimize the number uh, of ultra-Orthodox young men who are uh, conscripted in the coming years. That's, so my instinct is they will stay with the government. Mm, so short term, likely to stay with the government. What about long term? I mean, long term, I think that, um, you know, the real question is, will the society be able to step up and uh, form a situation, create a situation in which uh, these folks who are who are who whose lifestyle depends on segregation from the rest of society to join a military, which which insists on yet men and women being together. Uh, there are issues they have with extra kosher food. There are all kinds of things. But the, but the key thing here to remember also is that because Israel has been at war since October and expects to continue to be at war, perhaps in yeah. Lebanon, the desire for uh, young men to increase the size of the army has grown and people want Thank more you, guys in the army. We'll leave it there.